episode 18. Jem's ears reddened from Atticus's compliment, but he looked up sharply when he saw Atticus stepping back. Atticus squinted at the snowman a while. He grinned, then laughed. Son, I can't tell what you're going to be, an engineer, a lawyer, or a portrait painter. You've perpetrated a near libel here in the front yard. We've got to disguise this fellow. Atticus suggested that Jem hone down his creation's front a little, swap a broom for the stove wood, and put an apron on him. Jem explained that if he did, the snowman would become muddy and cease to be a snowman. I don't care what you do as long as you do something, said Atticus. You can't go around making caricatures of the neighbors. I ain't a caricature, said Jem. It looks just like him. Mr. Avery might not think so. I know what, said Jem. He raced across the street, disappeared into Miss Maudie's backyard, and returned triumphant. He stuck her sun hat on the snowman's head and jammed her hedge clippers into the crook of his arm. Atticus said that would be fine. Miss Maudie opened her front door and came out on the porch. She looked across the street at us. Suddenly, she grinned. Jam Finch, she called. You devil, bring me back my hat, sir. Jem looked up at Atticus, who shook his head. She's just fussing, he said. She's really impressed with your accomplishments. Atticus strolled over to Miss Maudie's sidewalk, where they engaged in an arm-waving conversation. The only phrase of which I caught was, erected an absolute morphodite in that yard. Atticus, you'll never raise them. The snow stopped in the afternoon. The temperature dropped, and by nightfall, Mr. Avery's direst predictions came true. Calpurnia kept every fireplace in the house blazing, but we were cold. When Atticus came home that evening, he said we were in for it and asked Calpurnia if she wanted to stay with us for the night. Calpurnia glanced up at the high ceilings and long windows and shed. She thought she'd be warmer at her house. Atticus drove her home in the car. Before I went to sleep, Atticus put more coal on the fire in my room. He said the thermometer registered 16, that it was the coldest night in his memory, and that our snowman outside was frozen solid. Minutes later, it seemed, I was awakened by someone shaking me. Atticus's overcoat was spread across me. Is it morning already? Baby, get up. Atticus was holding out my bathrobe and coat. Put your robe on first, he said. Jem was standing beside Atticus, groggy and tousled. He was holding his overcoat closed at the neck. His other hand was jammed in his pocket. He looked strangely overweight. Hurry, hon, said Atticus. Here are your shoes and socks. Stupidly, I put them on. Is it morning? No. It's a little after one. Hurry now. That something was wrong finally got through to me. What's the matter? By then, he did not have to tell me. Just as the birds know where to go when it rains, I knew when there was trouble in our street. Soft taffeta-like sounds and muffled scurrying sounds filled me with helpless dread. Whose is it? Miss Maudie's, hon said Atticus gently. At the front door, we saw fire spewing from Miss Maudie's dining room windows. As if to confirm what we saw, the town fire siren wailed up, to the, up the scale to a treble pitch and remained there, screaming. It's gone, ain't it? moaned Jem. I expect so, said Atticus. Now listen, both of you. Go down and stand in front of the Radley place. Keep out of the way, do you hear? See which way the wind's blowing? Oh, said Jim. Atticus, reckon we ought to start moving the furniture out? 
Not yet, son. But do as I tell you. Run now. Take care of Scout, you hear? Don't let her out of your sight. With a push, Atticus started us toward the Radley front gate. We stood watching the street fill with men and cars while fire silently devoured Miss Maudie's house. Why don't they hurry? Why don't they hurry? muttered Jim. We saw why. The old fire truck, killed by the cold, was being pushed from town by a crowd of men. When the men attached its hose to a hydrant, the hose burst and water shot up, tinkling down on the pavement. Oh, Lord, Jim. Jim put his arm around me. Hush, Scout, he said. It ain't time to worry yet. I'll let you know when. The men of Maycomb, in all degrees of dress and undress, took furniture from Miss Maudie's house to a yard across the street. I saw Atticus carrying Miss Maudie's heavy oak rocking chair, and I thought it sensible of him to save what she valued most. Sometimes we heard shouts. Then Mr. Avery's face appeared in an upstairs window. He pushed a mattress out the window into the street and threw down furniture until men shouted, Come down from there, Dick. The stairs are going. Get out of there, Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery began climbing through the window. Scout, he's stuck, breathed Jim. Oh, God. Mr. Avery was wedged tightly. I buried my head under Jim's arm and didn't look again till Jim cried, He got loose, Scout. He's all right. I looked up to see Mr. Avery cross the upstairs porch. He swung his legs over the railing and was sliding down a pillar when he slipped. He fell, yelled, and hit Miss Maudie's shrubbery. Suddenly, I noticed that the men were backing away from Miss Maudie's house, moving down the street toward us. They were no longer carrying furniture. The fire was well into the second floor and had eaten its way to the roof. Window frames were black against a vivid orange center. Jim, it looks like a pumpkin. Scat, look! Smoke was rolling off our house and Mitch Rachel's house like a fog off a riverbank, and men were pulling hoses toward them. Behind us, the fire truck from Abbotsville screamed around the curve and stopped in front of our house. That book, I said. What? said Jim. That Tom Swift book, it ain't mine. It's Dill's. Don't worry, Scout. It ain't time to worry yet, said Jim. He pointed. Look at yonder. In a group of neighbors, Atticus was standing with his hands in his overcoat pockets. He might have been watching a football game. Miss Maudie was beside him. See there, he's not worried yet, said Jim. Why ain't he on top of one of those houses? He's too old. He'd break his neck. You think we ought to make him get our stuff out? Let's don't pester him. He'll know when it's time, said Jim. The Abbotsville fire truck began pumping water on our house. A man on the roof pointed to places that needed it most. I watched our absolute morphodite go black and crumble. Miss Maudie's sun hat settled on top of the heap. I could not see her hedge clippers. In the heat between our house, Miss Rachel's and Miss Maudie's, the men had long ago shed coats and bathrobes. They worked in pajama tops and night shirts stuffed into their pants. But I became aware that I was slowly freezing where I stood. Jim tried to keep me warm, but his arm was not enough. I pulled free of it and clutched my shoulders. By dancing a little, I could feel my feet. Another fire truck appeared and stopped in front of Miss Stephanie Crawford's. There was no hydrant for another hose, and the men tried to soak her house with hand extinguishers. Miss Maudie's tin roof quelled the flames. Roaring, the house collapsed. Fire gushed everywhere, followed by a flurry of blankets from men on top of the adjacent houses, beating out sparks and burning chunks of wood. It was dawn before the men began to leave. 
first one by one, then in groups. They pushed the Maycomb fire truck back to town. The Abbotsville truck departed. The third one remained. We found out the next day it had come from Clark's Ferry, 60 miles away. 